Okay, so let's move on to measurements. What types of devices do we use in the bake shop to uh, measure our ingredients? So what is the difference between weight and volume? So weight is how heavy an item is or how dense it is. Volume is how much space an item fills up. So the best example I can give of this is brown sugar. If you have a recipe that calls for one cup of packed brown sugar, the way that I pack it might be different than the way my husband packs it. So he will be applying more pressure in packing the brown sugar than I will. And then when you measure those two cups of packed brown sugar, they're going to weigh differently. So in baking, we like to weigh everything because it keeps it more precise. Consistency is what's gonna keep your customers coming back for more. It is the constant in our industry. So weighing our ingredients enables all of the team to make the recipes the same way every time. So that your product is always consistent every time you make it. So that you're getting a consistent yield, you're getting a consistent taste, you're getting a consistent shape. So when we, when we get into our final products and we start to measure them, we use um, things like ice cream scoops to measure cookies. So ice cream scoops come in different sizes. Um, it enables you to quickly and efficiently scoop your batter, but that they're all the same size. Why does it matter if they're all the same size? So you want all of your items to be, or all of your cookies to be the same size on the same bake so that you can sell them for the same price and so that they bake at the same time and at the right temperature and that one side of the pan isn't burning while the other one is underbaked. So you want them to be consistently and you want to be able to sell them at the same price. So count would be a, a standard unit of measure in terms of like eggs or vanilla bean or something like that. So if you see a formula that says five each, that means five eggs or five vanilla beans. It's just a unit of measure. All right, so let's go back to gluten. So gluten is formed with your two, you have your two gluten proteins in your flour. So you have your glutenin and you have your gliadin. When you, when, you add mix, when you add moisture and you add mixing, those two proteins start to link up. The more mixing you do, the tighter it gets, the tighter it gets, the tighter it gets, the tighter it gets until you have a really, really strong matrix. In breads, you want that really strong matrix so that you have a really long and elastic chain of gluten. For pastries, cookies, cakes, biscuits, you want a very short gluten strand. So you want it to kind of look like this rather than this. So that means less mixing. Um, that means flours with a lower protein percentage. So that means that we're going to be working with all-purpose flour, pastry flour, cake flour, because of the gluten that's naturally found in those flours with how it's processed. So in controlling gluten, we want to look at these four factors. So of course, we talked about the flour. We're going to be using different flours that have a lower protein content. Shortening also helps to shorten your gluten strands. That's where the term shortening came from. So when, if you watch my biscuit demo or my rub-in method, we take our dry ingredients, we sift them, and we take our butter cold and we rub it into our flour like this. And that's so that we're taking our gluten strands and coating them individually in fat. The reason for that is because as you mix your dough, your gluten strands are going to start to link up. If they're lubricated in the fat, then they're going to be slipping on each other and slipping on each other like this. And that's what's going to give you a really tender structure because of that shortening that is shortening your gluten strands. It's a short strand rather than a long strand. Um, when you start to mix in your liquids, you want to make sure that you aren't mixing for a very long time when you're mixing anything in. So as soon as you add your flour in, your gluten is going to start to develop. So when you watch my creaming video when I'm making tart dough, 
You'll notice that um, to prevent my overmixing, I add my flour half at a time and I pulse it very quickly on the mixer just until it's incorporated. As soon as you see your flour incorporated, you're done mixing. So you don't want to do, forget your mixing methods from breads in Bake Shop 1. This is the whole new ball game. So our goal here is to control our gluten and keep it very short and tender. So no over mixing. So this is the baking process of when your, um, when your product goes in the oven. This is kind of similar to your 12 steps of bread baking from Bake Shop 1. So if you look at these seven steps, this is what's happening to your product. So when it goes in the oven raw, first your fats start to melt. Then your gases start to expand. If you have any yeast in your product, your yeast is gonna get killed. Uh, the thermal death point of yeast is 140 degrees. Then your proteins start to coagulate, your starches start to gel, and then that's when your moisture, the last bit of moisture starts to cook off. That enables your crust formation and your browning to happen. We're just gonna skip over our yeast products. I think you guys did enough of that in Big Shop One. And we're going to move on to quick breads. So you want a very short gluten development on these. You want them to be very tender. Um, you always wanna work with your biscuits and your scones while they are chilled so that you are maintaining their integrity. Um, and you're gonna have different types of doughs and batters in your quick breads. So quick breads are anything that uses a chemical leavener. So your chemical leaveners mean that you don't need fermentation. So yeast is gonna stay in Bake Shop 1 with our yeasted doughs. Quick breads use baking powder and baking soda. So these two chemical leaveners are what define quick breads. The reason they're called quick breads is because you don't have to wait for the fermentation. They're quick. So your expansion or your uh, leavening is coming from your baking soda and your baking powder, and that happens as soon as it goes in the oven. So they are heat activated. So different types of um, doughs or items that might fall into quick breads would be biscuits, scones, pound cake, um, lemon loaf, zucchini bread, pumpkin bread, muffins, so some are very stiff dough and others are batters. So we're gonna go over a couple of the mixing methods for quick breads. So like we said, we have a very short uh, desired gluten in this and that's achieved by making sure that we are not over mixing our dough. So our biscuit method, if you watch my demo, on the rubbin method. The rubbin method and the biscuit method are the same thing. So you're gonna take all of your dry ingredients, your sugar, your flours, um, salt, your leavening agents, sift them into a big bowl, and then you're gonna cut or rub your fat in. So your fat is gonna be cold. So cold butter cut into like a size of a quarter, and you dump that into your dry ingredients and you toss it just to coat and then you start to rub the fat into those dry ingredients so that you're shortening your gluten strands. Remember we talked about the lubrication of your strands. So you want them to slip on each other to, to create that short gluten um, texture. If you have any types of mix-ins like chives, scallions, chocolate chips, you add that along with your butter um, to get nice really like layered biscuits, nice flaky layers, you want your butter to be uh, pretty big. So I like to work my butter until it's about the size of a walnut. Um, then you toss all of your inclusions in and then you add your liquids. So if you look at step number three on here, you add your liquids into your dry just until it's combined. Again, do not over mix. As soon as everything comes together, you're done mixing. If you go, well, let's just go back to the biscuit method. So the biscuit method is the same as the scone method. Uh, the only difference in scones is you want your texture, your final texture of your product to be what we call mealy, or um, it feels kind of crumbly in your mouth. So to achieve that, that's all in the fat. 
So we're just gonna work our butter a little bit more fine. You're gonna work it instead of walnut size for biscuits, you wanna work it until it's about a, the size of a pea. Um, and that will give you um, in your final bake a more crumbly texture, kind of like a shortbread. Your muffin method, pretty easy. Mix all your dries in one bowl, mix all of your liquids in the other, mix them together with a whisk. Super easy. Um, fold in your inclusions at the end. So if you have blueberries, chocolate chips, any type of nut, you wanna fold that in by hand all the way at the end of your mixing. Again, do not overmix. As soon as your ingredients are combined, you're done. And last, we have our creaming method. So these are just a couple little pointers that I have here, but what's important is that you want all room temperature ingredients. So with your biscuit method, you're using cold butter. For your creaming method, you want room temperature butter. It takes one pound of butter to come to room temperature three days. So three days um, to be room temp all the way through into the center. I always make sure that my eggs are totally beaten together so that as I am adding them into my mixture, that I'm adding a little bit at a time. Uh, that's gonna help in your emulsification. So if you look at my steps over here, you have your room temperature butter and sugar. You're gonna use your paddle attachment on medium speed until it's light and fluffy. Once it's light and fluffy, it's getting light because of the aeration. So the sugar is acting as an abrasive and starting to incorporate air into your mixture and that's changing the color. Once it gets light and fluffy, scrape it down, add your eggs in a little bit at a time on second speed. I like to scrape down halfway uh, between adding my eggs and then you want to add your, your dry ingredients. So I sift all of my dries and then I add them depending on how much I have. In my creaming video, I added half my dries pulsed it until it's combined, and then I add the next half. If you have liquids, you could either mix them in at the end, or you could alternate adding your liquids and your dries. So you add one third of your dries, and then you add one third of the liquid. One third of your dries, one third of your liquid, and you repeat that until they're gone. And I think that's done. That's it, all right. So the, this PowerPoint goes in coordination with the videos that I posted on YouTube. So this is in coordination with my creaming videos, or my creaming video, my tart dough, and the rubbin method. So go ahead and check those out. And um, our next lecture will be on cookies.